Uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman, and I work here in author events. And more importantly, I think, you'll think, I am a 1991 Space Camp graduate. Um, all right. It's my honor to be here tonight to introduce Apollo 11 astronaut and American icon, Buzz Aldrin. You know him as the first person to perform a successful spacewalk and the second person in human history to set foot on the moon. He is also known as a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest American peacetime award. Asteroid 6470 Aldrin and the Aldrin Crater on the moon both carry his name, as does a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. <laughs> Did you also know that Dr. Aldrin holds a doctorate in astronautics, that in the halls of NASA he was long known as, I love this, Dr. Rendezvous? for the docking techniques he devised for spacecraft that became critical to the success of the Gemini and Apollo programs and that are still in use to this day. And that he founded the Share Space Foundation, a nonprofit organization devoted to opening the doors of space tourism for all people. In his book, Magnificent Desolation, The Long Journey Home from the Moon, Buzz told the tale of the historic moon landing and his triumph over other struggles later in his life. He's also the author of three other nonfiction books, two scientifically, scientifically accurate novels, and two children's books. In No Dream is Too High, Buzz illustrates the finely honed principles and lessons taught by an extraordinary life. Dr. Aldrin will be in conversation tonight with his mission director, Christina Corp. Ladies and gentlemen, Join me in extending a warm Philadelphia welcome to Buzz Aldrin and Christina Corp. I'm Christina Corp. I'm Buzz's mission director. Actually, mission control director, it says on my card, but his son says I have no control, so mission director is much more accurate. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. We're very excited about this new book. I wrote the foreword to the book, so this is partially why um, I'm do in this capacity. Buzz and I are kind of joined at the hip when we do uh, live events um, because we just travel all over the world. I'm responsible for all of his appearances, all his media, all his social media, all his making sure he's got his fly zipped apparently. He just asked us before we came out, <laughs> smoothing his hair down. So uh, we're very close. We are like family. I've been with him for eight and a half years and he calls my kids his mascots. Actually, what he usually says is she produces mascots, and people are like, I don't understand what that means. She, she thinks I'm a, a little kid, you know, she's taking care of me. You are my biggest I'm kid. I'm twice your age. You are twice my age. Uh, people ask me how many kids I have, and I say, I have three. I have two little ones and <laughs> one big one. <laughs> anyway, this book is a glimpse, kind of. It, it's some stories back from the time, you know, uh, when he was an astronaut and before. One of the things that I've always loved is when we ride in the car, he'll tell me fighter pilot stories. And so you're getting to hear some of those th in this book that you maybe have never heard because everyone's so focused on the moon. But you get to hear about that and a bunch of other things that he hasn't really ever covered before and, and including the last few years. So normally we have slides behind us, but they decided that Buzz was so charming and enticing he didn't need them tonight. They, they couldn't afford it. <laughs> But so after you buy enough books, I'll be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually going to um, use the book, though, a little bit as a guide. And then hopefully when you get your copies, you'll relate to what's in here. Um, so at the beginning, it shows some family photos. Stay awake, of like stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's, hi, Sean. Uh, no, so what I love is it shows pictures of Buzz when he's a little boy. He's so doggone cute. He still looks the same, just bigger. And um, when he, oh, that one's really cute. I love that one when you're on there. I don't know what you're doing. Being reckless already at the age that, of four. That's not the New Jersey Shore. Where is it? It's Culver Lake. Where is that? Sussex County. I don't know where that no, is No, I either. grew up in <laughs> Essex County. No, it's. All right, well, anyway, let's start with how. <laughs> So people often think he got the name Buzz because uh, he was a fighter pilot, but why don't you tell them how you got the name Buzz, Buzz? <coughs> well, no, 
Don't you want to start back a little earlier than that? When you were in the womb? <laughs> Which womb? <laughs> okay. Well, oh, what was her name? Oh, oh, I know uh. what he means. Buzz's father, Edwin Eugene Aldrin, Sr., met his mother, Marion, in the Philippines. And why don't you tell about your mother? She was the uh, oldest child of an uh, army chaplain, uh, married to Jesse, and his name was Faye, F-A-Y-E, Arnold Moon. So the oldest daughter was Marion Moon, married eventually Edwin E. Aldrin, not senior, we don't use that, in the Philippines. Now I got to check on the uh, breadth of understanding of space of people here. You mean if they know what the moon is? No. <laughs> Well, my, my father <laughs> grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, right? He graduated from high school in short pants at age 15. <clears throat> Went to the local university, Clark University. And his physics professor was Robert Goddard. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, but it's happy. <laughs> so, we got a good grade. <laughs> but then he needed to get a master's degree, because he still looked pretty young. So there's Worcester Polytech, local. He finishes that, and then down the road is Cambridge, MIT. So he starts working on his doctor's degree at MIT. Well, something happened uh, World War I. And so he was uh, diverted from getting his final, uh, and they wanted to put him in the Coast Artillery. Now, here's a guy who's real aviation guy. He, he, his thesis was spinning airplanes at MIT. They want to put him in the Coast Artillery? He says, no, I want to go in the Signal Corps. There wasn't any Air Corps. It was the Signal Corps. Balloons, airplanes. Okay, let's move on. I want you to talk about you. So let's talk oh, about, though, who I, your father knew, which influenced you. He w In the Philippines. Why did he go there? Well, he was an aide to Billy Mitchell. General Billy Mitchell, <laughs> the court martial of Billy Mitchell. No? Okay. That doesn't make them know it more if they don't know it. Okay, go on. No. <laughs> no. All right, but just. Look it up. Look I it up. I want to get to you. So. He was court martialed. Oh, no, no, no. Don't Because the about rule that. said fly 15,000 feet. We're, we're seeing whether airplanes or battleships are going to win. So somebody wrote the rules, and you fly 15,000 feet and drop your bombs. He knew better than that. <laughs> Die bombing. Sink, sunk the battleship. Okay, well that's, that's why they the court-martialed him. <laughs> okay, so your father, though, was an early <laughs> aviation pioneer, and he knew some very, very influential people like, and don't go into all their histories, he knew Orville Wright, Charles Lindbergh. He called him Lindy. Yeah. And your sister rode in the plane that was christened by? Amelia Earhart. So he came from uh, some aviation royalty, as you can see, like the very pioneers of it. So I want to move on, Buzz, because I do want to give you more time, and we don't have a lot of time tonight. No, but so real quick, like... He came back because of his uh, <laughs> academic experience. He became the head, the commandant 
of the Air Corps Engineering School, 1920-21. Now back then they called it McCook Field, you don't know, became Wright Field, became Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The Air Corps Engineering School became the Air Force Institute of Technology. So he was there for about five or six years at the beginning of the organization that paid for my MIT education. Now, isn't, it, isn't that kind of what goes around comes around? Okay, let's not go mm. too crazy now. Uh, let's jump that, back. So your parents met, your dad's an aviation see, pioneer. Now the, the lesson in the book is to marry, no, to <laughs> grow up in, in a productive family. <laughs> So, um, but how did you get the name Buzz? So, you had two sisters. Uh, well, no. No, no. <laughs> no, my mother was a family of two girls and a boy. My family, Eddie and Marion, two girls and a boy. That's me, the youngest. And uh, so I had older sister that was learning how to speak. Now, the Air Corps people, Eddie Aldrin, my mother hated that. So Eugene, no, the whole family called my father Gene. What are they going to call this young kid, Junior? No. I, I got two older sisters. Oh, that's your brother. Buzzer. Uh, that's who I am, I'm Buzzer. So in the book, you'll see a Christmas card when <laughs> from he's a little kid and he wrote, you know, in his little kid handwriting, Buzzer. <laughs> so he's been Buzz his whole life. So the lesson there is if you have a name that isn't going to work, uh, <laughs> somehow uh, get somebody to fix it so it's a, a nice, catchy name. That's a bonus. That's not in the book, <laughs> that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he, he had this role model of his father. And, uh, but you were very, your dad was a military guy, and you went, uh, into the uh, military academy at West Point, age of 17. It was uh, early. You were pretty young, right? You were the youngest? No, before that. We had to have, we had to put a war in there. Well. World War II. We can't, don't go in the history of World War II. My father was <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel. Mm. I grew up seeing all the mail come to Major. Yeah, I have no control. Okay, so he's manager of Newark Airport. And he gets recalled uh, right after Pearl Harbor. And a guy born the same year, early aviator. They ought to be the same, but there is a difference. Jimmy Doolittle would fly around crazy airplanes. And my father was a judge of the Cleveland Air Races. And he won an airplane by writing a little essay for a radio program. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> um, so anyway, but you did go to <laughs> Military Academy at West Point. You're 17 years old. Um, and from there, you graduated third in your class. There's another lesson. Oh, no. <laughs> no, my father saw a lot of retired pilots, Air Corps and Navy. So we got to see, when they retired, how well did they do? And he said, uh, you know, you should go to the Naval Academy because retired Navy people are better businessmen than West Pointers are. And I always wondered how he knew that. Oh. Should I tell him now? Well, without going through everything, a guy graduates from West Point, second lieutenant, he commands a platoon, 
first lieutenant, a company, then uh, he moves up and there's a battalion, regiment. Now, how good is he doing his job of leadership? Ah, oh, it's pretty obvious how well did the people do that he's commanding. So, uh, the purpose of West Point is to train leaders for our army or air force. So we have an air force academy. Uh, the Navy, well, let's see. An ensign, that's like a second lieutenant. He gets on a minesweeper or a destroyer and there's a captain in charge. But. There are a bunch of sailors, but there's warrant officers, bosun mates, gunnery officers, or not officers, enlisted people. So the ensign really has nothing to do with the sailors. It's the other people that are kind of leading them. Now the ensign, uh, his job is to keep the captain from getting into trouble. And that's by not knowing what the higher command is telling him to do or what they're liable to, so he has to start talking to the people in higher commands, higher echelon. So the captain's too busy uh, doing things, so he, his job is to really get to know the people up there so he can anticipate. You know what that's called? Networking. But I like how you totally rebelled against your dad then and went to West Point, right? He wanted you to go there to the Naval Academy and you went right, to West that, Point. That's why. You're stubborn. And I said, hey, wait a minute, I, I get seasick. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, here's an aircraft carrier. Why would I want to try and land at night and uh, rain's coming on that little aircraft carrier? In the Air Force, they do it differently. They got a nice long runway, and, <laughs> and it's not moving. <laughs> that, that makes more sense to me. <laughs> so let's jump forward a little bit, and hopefully, you have not offended any Navy people in here. Um, he's not. He's going to say more about the Navy guys. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, but West Point is Army. How'd you get in the Air Force? Don't go too well, far there into that. There wasn't an Air Force Academy. There was not. So but they started, they became a separate service in 1947. Hold on, I want you to tell my favorite fighter pilot story. Oh. So he, he graduates third in his class from West Point, and then he actually becomes a fighter pilot in Korea. So one of my favorite stories involves Congressman Sam Johnson from Texas. He's, a, he's been a congressman for a long time, and he was Buzz's wingman in Korea. And uh, he actually, I'm just going to tell this part so that we can He went to over. SMU. Whatever. The, the, the point is, what though, the interesting thing is he continued to be a fighter pilot, and when Buzz went to the moon, he was in the Vietnam War, and he, he got shot down. He was a POW. So he was a POW when Buzz walked on the moon. And he said that they tried to convince the POWs that the Russians had beat the Americans to the moon. And then he you know, heard, however they hear, that they actually made it to the moon. But he did not know, because he was a POW, that Buzz was there, too. Not till later, and Buzz had taken his taken like a token or something, right? Basically, to oh, in honor a, of him. Uh, a POW band. Uh, bracelet. Yeah, in honor of him, which he heard later. But anyway, so my one of my favorite stories involves Sam Johnson. So when they were uh, on a combat mission, so tell that really fast, just quickly. Short. Okay, we, Sam and I were in the same flight. There was a, a Ace, who was our flight commander. Cecil Buster. Uh, so he doesn't lead every flight, but there was this one flight where we were cruising up and down the Yalu River over North Korea, and Manchuria's on that side. You're not supposed to be there. Uh, so we saw some MiGs flying south. Hmm, they're going to have to turn around and, and fly north again, so we'll cut them off when they do that. So they're going like this. <clears throat> now, Sam and I are separate, so uh, he's following me, my wingman, so we follow in 
I, I wasn't too sharp in the turn, but we're following him at about 3,000 feet. You're not gonna get too many hits that far away, but if you can scare them and get them to turn, then you can catch up. So I tried doing that a couple times. Uh, uh, the fuel gauge is getting pretty low. We're quite a ways north of the river. Uh, but I think the rule said something about it's okay, hot pursuit is okay. <laughs> well, this was pursuit, maybe not too hot yet, <laughs> but that's what we wanted. So the fuel gauge getting lower and lower, and we're just, because these guys are descending and make it, making more speed. So Sam is back here doing what he should, making sure nobody's going to attack me. So I say, hey, Sam, getting low on fuel. Let's go back. Turn around, head back to, uh, now we're still over North Korea. So we head back and uh, get set on the heading. So I look around. Where's Sam? So I'm just saying that to myself. So I hit the mic button and say, hey, Sam, where are you? Where are you? Lead. Hey, lead, I'll be right with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, he's still following the bigs going north. Now it's his time to, sh but he, I said, come on, Sam, we got to head back. So he's way behind me. So I said, uh, Okay, I'll make a circle over Pyongyang, North Korea, and maybe you can catch up to me. Well, he came fairly close. We're, and we couldn't make our base, which was too far south of the bomb line. He, yeah, the 38th parallel or whatever uh, is the difference. So, uh, I'm waiting for him to come in, and uh, I know he's there, but I go ahead and make my landing, and uh, he didn't tell me this till afterward, but he was so low on fuel, he had to shut the engine down and glide, <laughs> and then start it up again and uh, come in to land. So you landed at the wrong airport, though, because you guys didn't have no, enough yeah. fuel, right? Well, our squadron commander's back there waiting for us to get back home. <laughs> Was he ever, I don't know whether I can say He's that. He's worried if there's kids he out was, there. <laughs> <laughs> Peeled? <She's old>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we don't have a lot of time, right, Andy? Are we, uh, how are we doing? No. Okay. So let's jump to the moon, though, but, or no, let's first jump to, I know, you got so much to say, but, because um, we do want to take some questions from the audience, and then you'll probably get to talk about Mars, so just put that in your cap. Um, so I'm sure you've seen now, and if we had the picture here, of course, we'd talk about the new famous selfie in space, right? So this is featured in the new book, and uh, I l he took this, do you want to, I don't know if you can tell it fast enough. You know all about the moon, Apollo. No, no, but I do want to have you tell a couple things about the moon. Let's go to the moon. Time. Let's right. go to the moon. Okay, so Neil There is Wet Mars out there. Come I on, know, we're but, you know, let's talk real quick about the moon. So, uh, of course, they landed. Everybody knows that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's gloss over that part. Three and a half days. So they get there, Tranquility Base, Eagle has landed. Actually, the first words on the moon, though, were... But Light comes on, landing gear is up here, there's a probe that comes down, and when it touches the, the surface, it bends. It's meant to do that. It turns on a switch, turns on a light. First words, me to him and to the rest of the world. Contact light, engine stop. That's you know, I like I gotta tell Neil to shut off the engine. <laughs> We're on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they land, they do their stuff, they go out on the moon. 
I want to tell. I want you to tell the circuit breaker story. That's why I'm gonna jump. To okay. That. Okay. So we know they went to the moon. One thing you may not be aware of is that uh, Neil had the camera almost the whole time. Buzz sent it down, and so all the famous moon landing photos you see, those are all Buzz. There's poor Neil. You took like one photo of him with his backside. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I did have the camera, but I was taking very official pictures, going around to see if there was any damage on the lander and how much, uh, a big a hole it was underneath, and uh, the bootprints just made such a remarkable, firm uh, rendition. There was nothing, couldn't walk in sand, you couldn't work in any dirt that I know of here that would replicate the boot print. Fascinating. Why would it do that? I gotta take a before and after. Here's a nice place to take a picture, put my foot down, take another picture. <laughs> That's going to look awful lonesome. <laughs> OK, so I find another place, put my foot down, and I move it a little bit so you can see the boot print and the boot. <laughs> that one wasn't as popular as the lonesome. <laughs> but the funny thing is, so Buzz took the boot print. So like all the famous ones, like the visor shot, those are all uh, Buzz, because Neil took the photos. But Buzz took the boot print, and Buzz's son Andy says, Dad, it is ironic. I have taken thousands of photos in my life, and you've taken like three photos <laughs> in your whole life, and they're, it's like one of them is the most iconic in history. <laughs> so I want to tell the circuit breaker uh, story because Buzz always thinks people know this story, and so probably if you're a heavy-duty space person, you may know this story, but they, they did their thing on the moon, they came back in, they depressurized the cabin, they had to actually save weight um, in order to lift off. So they had to get rid of some things and throw them out. I'm telling this part so yeah, you don't drag out. Yeah, we come up the ladder <laughs> with dusty feet. And we get inside with dusty feet. And we stomp them off, and now the dust is on the floor. So we're supposed to go to sleep now. So. Uh, there's only one flat place in this machine. No beds, no chairs. You stand up and you land and you lift off. So I say to Neil, I take dibs on the floor. <laughs> okay, he had to sit back on something and lean back. Uh, but, you know, he, he's kind to his junior partner, his co-pilot. So I lie down on the floor, and it's getting cold in there, so we had our suits on, of course. We turned the heat way up, it's still cold, put the helmets on. Um, so now trying to go to sleep, and we're in the process of turning the lights out, but I see in the dust that we trapped in, a little black thing with a little, uh, round thing on the end, and I know what that is. It's a circuit breaker, broken off. Well, that's going to be hard to uh, pull that out or push it in. I wonder which one it is. <laughs> now, you, you have a lot of them pulled out, for example, in the other spacecraft. You don't want to have the parachute jettison switch. <laughs> There's a switch that'll do that, but you gotta have the circuit breaker in to do that, so you pull it out, because it would be embarrassing to get rid of the parachute <laughs> the wrong place. Okay, so I look at which circuit breaker, hmm, my heart goes down, or swallows, or whatever happens when you read something that you don't want to read, or you don't want to see it, you don't want to understand it. The broken off, little hole there, engine arm. Wow. That's the one that's out all the time, until you get ready to land, and that's a descent engine, so you push it in. Now you, the engine 
gets you down, contact light, shut the engine off, pull out the circuit layer. But it's the same circuit that's going to uh, light the ascent engine when you get ready to go. Now, wait a minute, that's the one that's bringing us back home, and uh, there's some doubt <laughs> as to whether it's going to work or not. I better not monkey around with it and get, get a circuit going at the wrong time. So, of course, we told the guys back in Houston, and they said, well, gee, that's a problem. <laughs> no, wait a minute. We were supposed to say that. We, were, we had that, we almost had that famous line, Houston, we got a problem. <laughs> no, but we left it for Apollo 13. And, you know, I'm friendly with Jim Lovell. So the guys in, uh, back in Mission Control, they said, uh, well, well, we'll see if there's some way in the circuits and whatever it is to do some, something that'll uh, get around that circuit breaker some way so that when you uh, get ready to lift off and come home, that it'll work. <laughs> so here we are, two guys up there. There's a big question as to whether we're gonna get back home or not. And this, the checklist says, and you're supposed to do everything on the checklist, and the guys in Houston said, uh, okay, we're going to work at a problem. Go ahead and go to sleep. <laughs> I didn't think anything about it. That's what you're supposed to do. We haven't got anything else to do. Go to sleep. Imagine. You don't know whether you're going to get back home or not, and you go to sleep. Well, that's, that's what fighter pilots do. They do what? what you're able to do at the time and hope for the best. So we get up in the morning, not good news. They couldn't figure any way. They said, you're just gonna have to push that in somehow, somehow. <laughs> but not the wrong time. Let's not wait till three minutes before launch. Let's try it out about two hours. Now, I, I look, and I think I got a little finger. <laughs> yeah. Well, wait a minute, there's electricity back there. I don't, okay. I got a, I got a ballpoint pen. Now, wait a minute, there's electricity, and I can <laughs> short the circuit at the wrong time? No. Oh, that's right, I have a felt tip pen. Great, I'll use that when the time comes. The time came, felt tip pen. The guys back in mission control, they know what's going on all the time, and they can see that that circuit breaker is in. You know, they know everything that's going on in that spacecraft, really. Except that you they didn't know you had a felt tip <laughs> pen. <laughs> they don't always know how to fix it. But <laughs> But he still has that circuit breaker and the felt tip pen. So someday we'll put them in a, a museum. Um, but it's, we're, so we're, we're done eBay? with- eBay, eBay. <laughs> <laughs> um, one time I went on a field trip and we had this terrible ice cream sandwich <laughs> and they said, this is what you had to eat if you were in a spaceship. <laughs> is that really what you had to eat? <laughs> We, we had water. Now, in the other ship, <laughs> they had hot water for coffee. We didn't have any hot water, just not cold, just ordinary water. Uh, no powdered ice cream. You can buy that in a space store. None of that. Doesn't taste very good anyway. You had a ham spread. No ice cream. Um, but we were uh, advancing in our uh, nutrition, our dietary stuff, 
We had a can. Tuna fish, pasty stuff. So we had some bread. So there's a video. I've got the bread in this hand. and uh, like a knife I got too much a going on here. So I let go of the bread, around. and the bread <laughs> floats around like this. <laughs> The bread's like and now I got the can, there. so I get uh, some pasty stuff, and I let go of the can. It goes <laughs> like this. Like I grab the bread. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a whole new world up there <laughs> in zero gravity. It's not zero gravity. The moon's out there. It's in the Earth's gravity field, and when you're going around, you're in the Earth's gravity. So how can you say zero gravity? Well, the thing is that the spacecraft is going in orbit. You are everything else in the same thing. So you're floating. You're moving 17,000 miles an hour, but you're moving like this, and that centrifugal force is pushing you out and the gravity's pulling you in. This is what he thinks about all day long, by the way. Um, the and <laughs> if you're lucky, the two are equal. <laughs> and when they're equal, then everybody is floating. Okay, I he, can open the hatch and, and go out, and I'm floating. He 17, did. 17,000 miles an hour. 17,000 miles an hour. That's how fast he was going around the Earth. Every 90 minutes. Isn't that cool? And I'm sorry, he had no terrible ice cream sandwich, apparently. <laughs> he had other terrible things <laughs> that he had to put water in, dry powdered food. Little shrimp. Freeze-dried shrimp. <laughs> you get the water gun out, and you put the water in there, and then you stick it up here on Velcro. <laughs> <clears throat> for about three, four minutes, and then you go pick it up and you undo the. Man, it's uh, really good. Oh. <laughs> kind of crude. I'm glad you like it. We're that. doing better, much better. Okay, let's take. Uh, hi, thank you. So, uh, my father was a huge fan of you, and uh, I actually grew up uh, at Buzz Aldrin Elementary School, but ah. and I didn't actually know anything about you. Which until one? I was in the, the one in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Okay. Yeah. What? You're talking about the Buzz Holder Elementary <laughs> School? Yeah, in no, Reston, Virginia. I actually one. didn't know much about you until like sixth grade, but <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's just named after the school. So, uh, anyways, my question to you well, is Sixth grade, you're leaving. It's only <laughs> up to sixth grade. <laughs> so, my question to you is how exactly did you get selected now, to we're go gonna to fix the, that. My hometown, Montclair. No high school. Everybody wants to remember Montclair High School. There's a junior high. They don't call them that anymore. They're <clears throat> middle schools. So they'll have seven, eight, ninth grade at Buzz Aldrin Middle School. I think it's now six, seven, no, eight. Go ahead. Um, they're literally changing the middle school he went to as a kid to Buzz Aldrin Middle School. It's very, very cool. <laughs> But let the guy ask his question. So my, <laughs> my question to you is, how exactly did you get selected to go up into space, and what was it like? How did you get selected? You got to be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> and you have to do a little planning so you have the right equipment, brains. It doesn't always work out, but you can still be lucky. And uh, I've been pretty lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And if I wasn't, yeah, when I was selected as an astronaut, all the Mercury guys had already flown. And they were doing the first couple of Gemini flights. That's two guys. And it could, Mercury could just roll, but Gemini could translate go faster, slower. It could rendezvous. So I wanna, he's gonna go in the history of Gemini in a second, if we, if we don't, if I don't interrupt, because I wanna get other questions in, but what I do wanna say is, he does have a doctorate in astronautics from MIT. So he's no dummy. Um, education played a huge role in that. 
you know. So y and you gotta really, really, you kind of almost have to be foolishly optimistic. But I will tell you that he he didn't make it the first time he applied. He was turned down the first time because he wasn't a test pilot. Not oh, not too young, no. But no, I, I had not again. chosen to go through test pilot training. Um, that's a special precision flying. And uh, as you go through flight school, there's somebody in that group who's always the first to solo. And uh, these are the guys that uh, are just like they're born in the cockpit. I mean, they're immediate. Uh, I was not quite like that. But you were Damn very good. smart. You were Damn very good. smart. And he used his uh, fighter pilot techniques for, for uh, intercepting enemy aircraft. And I'm going to do this so we can do it fast, take another question. And, that, and then devise, use that to devise a method, manned orbital rendezvous, which is how you join spacecraft in space. That's what they use today. That's what they use for Apollo. And I'm going to bring one more thing up because so, you sometimes bring it up. If you've seen The Martian, anybody seen The Martian? So Buzz is a orbital dynamics, like, I mean, that's his world. He knows that really well. And he developed, he can tell you more about the cycler, but in 1985, he actually figured out how to do tourism flights between the Earth and the moon. And then Tom Paine, who was the administrator of NASA, said, because uh, he got discouraged because NASA wasn't interested. He said, why don't you look at Mars? So Buzz developed this system of cycling spacecraft between the Earth and Mars to, uh, at that time, 1985, he calls it the cycler. I'm, I'm going to give you more time to explain it. The reason I'm bringing it up is because the, the Martian, the Hermes spacecraft, that is based on Buzz's cycler. And, and the ascent vehicles and the Mars ascent vehicles and descent. And so to me, when I read the book before the movie came out, I, I was reading it going, this is Buzz's cycler. I mean, this is totally his cycler. So we, at the end of the book, it was an e-book, Andy Weir said, they, they were interviewing him, and they, what's your perfect day? He said, brunch with Buzz Aldrin. I'm like, Buzz, we got to call him. <laughs> <laughs> so we did, and then they Skyped, and I said, I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is Buzz's cycler. And he's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> he goes, but I took liberties with the spacecraft design and he, the propulsion. He didn't use it according to the laws of no, gravity. No, he did. you got to watch it again. You're not paying attention. <laughs> but anyway... To me, what's so cool about that is that the whole world is, you know, who's seen this movie is exposed to Buzz's concept that he developed from his expertise. But it's sad to me, too, because people don't know it. They don't realize that they're being exposed to his no, brilliant No, my system mind. never would have left people up there. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what it really does is it takes people there and then swings by and a little later, it picks some other people, and they go there. Okay. Nobody Let's... comes home. Hi, so I have a two-part question. Oh, no. uh, one, given the very specific uh, conditions needed to go to Mars, when do you think is the earliest we could realistically expect to make it? And two, other than the inherent benefit of just human exploration, what is the biggest scientific benefit you expect to find from a mission to Mars? Okay, first, when do you think we'll get there? Yeah. Uh, we're not in good shape right now. We've got a long ways to recover. We don't even have a rocket and a spacecraft to take people to a $100 billion international space station. We have to rent rides from the Russians, just so if you don't know. We don't have a rocket. We've got to pay the Russians like 75 or $77 million per astronaut right now. But there's a crappy rocket being developed. So don't go b into how much you hate that rocket. We do have <laughs> Elon Musk and SpaceX and all of that, but why don't you tell them when there, you think we can. There are two, th two major things troubling us right now. Money. Politics. That ends up building the wrong stuff. And the other is money. It took 4% to go to the moon. Two people, one day. We did that six out of seven times. Three days was the most. Just two people. Stopped doing all that in 72. 
That's 1972. What do we got to show for it? Not much. Nobody's going to the moon, staying there, doing anything, yet we put that amount to begin to develop things. But you do have a plan. We are now at one half a percent, and that's what we've had for 10 or 15 years, and we're building rockets that are based on old stuff, because if we went to new stuff, people would lose their jobs to work on, on new stuff, and a, and a congressman would not get reelected if he does that. At any rate, you do have a plan, uh, which he actually wrote a book, Mission to Mars, uh, a few years ago. He's made a lot of changes since then, so he really needs to do another book so he can get it down on paper. But this young man's question was, when do you think that we will get there? So according to your plan. At the 50th anniversary of first landing on the moon. July 20th, 2019. No, that's not when. Yeah. That's fine. The president could, if coached properly, <laughs> say, I believe that this nation, within two decades, should lead international crews and land on Mars. That figures out to be 2039, almost 2040. So that that is uh, kind of my guess for that. Uh, see, I'm not being too explicit about landing and then what. See, now most plans today from NASA and others, they go there at the right time and they get there, but they got to come back at the right time. So after about a year and a half, they come back. Mars is empty until the next group goes. And they stay and they come back. So we have six people on Mars, zero. Six people, zero. Six people, that doesn't sound too good. Must be better than that. Because after the third time you do that, the politicians are gonna say, we, we know how to go to Mars. Let's spend the money over here. So everything you do is going to be gone because the politicians want money, something else. Well, we can fool them. <laughs> we can send six people and leave them there for a little bit, and then we'll go up to 12 and back to six back to 12, six. They can't cancel when we've got somebody at Mars. No, but, he's not but being. But that's really not, doesn't make a lot of sense. But he's not being mean to them because, Buzz, we're running out of time. To clarify, he wants to have some there at Phobos, use that as a staging point to robotically send down all the elements to build a base so that there's a base there that people can live at. So they're not just landing there and then they're just like setting they, up a tent. They don't know what Phobos is. I know. It's a little moon that goes around Mars. Uh, no, no, I hear whispers, they know. 4,000 miles, it goes around about uh, seven, eight hours. And it's fairly close. But we don't do things like that at the moon by convention, by years and years until recently, and I said, now why don't we act like we're the moon of the moon? You know, the moon of Mars. So let's get into an orbit like that. And now we can have relays, say we can assemble things instead of from way far out. That's what, uh, the Purdue study, the Aldrin Purdue study did last year. That's what everybody thinks. They're gonna put the fuel depot out in space. Let me clarify. Yeah. So Purdue University is, um, there's a professor there who, who really has believed in Buzz's cycler trajectory. He's helped him refine it. He's had other students. 
helped him get it better. And last year, they actually did a student design study that was awesome. And if you go to our website at buzzaldrin.com, you'll see Cycling Pathways to Occupy Mars. And the students created their own video, which is really cool to me to see these students explaining his concepts, and they animated it. They're doing another study right now that actually showcases uh, other elements, which is creating a base at the moon first, creating uh, uh, fuel depots. Well, he's changed his mind since they started about Have this. a design of a moon base just like the one you want at Mars. Now, the moon base, it can land in different places. We don't want to build them, that costs a lot of money, so we're going to get international countries to build them, land them, hmm, but we're going to bring them together and we'll make the final connections. Otherwise, it costs us lots and lots of money, and we pick up where we were 50 years ago. So, but we want to practice things. Ah, oh, but now we can put them together just as if we were at Mars, on the moon of Mars, because we've created something like that. That's new, <laughs> really. It sounds so obvious, as many things are. But people don't think of those because they're pigeonholed in what people have thought 20 years ago, more. So I'm, Buzz, we're, we're, it's amazing. we're really out of time. But I do want to read this dedication because he dedicated this book. It says, I dedicate this book to the dreamers, the out-of-the-box thinkers, and the seat-of-the-pants innovators like me. John Hubolt, Hubert Davis, Dick Batten, Charlie Bassett, Ed White, and Stephen Hawking. And so it's, uh, and then, but I dedicate it especially to my dear friends and Apollo 11 crewmates, Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins. So Buzz often thinks of really new, innovative things. He, he says his middle name is Innovation. And he really, really uh, values people who think outside the box. And he, sometimes he'll say to me, why didn't anybody think of that? And I'm like, because your mind thinks of things that normal people do not think of. He's not a normal person. <laughs> but, but I say that with love. <laughs> the net result is that we want other countries to begin to work together at the moon. Uh, China will be ahead, but we'll work with Europe to get them to understand uh, Japan, Russia, and uh, we will do things just like we're going to do at the moon or at Mars. We'll do them, and we'll put the fuel depot not out here, but there. Well, well people don't do that a little bit now. They're beginning to get smart. <laughs> but if we got fuel on the surface, and we have an orbit, and we can have a lower one too, and we're sending people up there uh, every six months, but we're sending them up much, much cheaper than any government spacecraft or rocket. And we got government rockets and government spacecraft coming along, but they're way too expensive. And that's why we retired the shuttle okay. and are waiting for these commercial. So Buzz, we do, if you want to like get back to the hotel before midnight. Okay, um, so <laughs> well, we send people to this no, orbit, no, no, no. we bring fuel up, we send a lander up, no people, no fuel, because we got the people and the fuel there, it lands, we got fuel down there, if we refuel it, goes back up, and the guys go back home and whatever other people left, we refuel it. Now other people come and they land. This is a reusable lander. Yes, that is and the point. <laughs> the launches are much more economical. We're offering reusability, sustainability. Europe, Russia, Japan, much, much better than Apollo was. Much better. If you want to learn more, you can go to buzzaldrin.com. There are a lot of details there. We're going to wrap so we can get to the book signing, Buzz. <laughs>